Just spoke with Thea and Dave. They, uh, they're they from 99 Content. And uh, funnily enough, we our first chat with Thea a year ago or something like that was literally our most popular podcast that we've ever done to date. Um, so it turns out content marketing is hugely important to financial advisors, which is why uh, this, I mean, this whole um, new series on marketing is kicking off. So uh, hopefully you enjoy. Uh, we go through how you can get, uh, you know, the most out of your own content. And also if you want to uh, touch base with them, they, they, they can do it for you. Um, but yeah, hopefully you enjoy. So who is Sun Super? Well, if you haven't been living under a rock, then you've probably heard of them. But just in case you have been, they currently hold the salubrious title of being the only super fund to be named Fund of the Year by no less than five different rating organizations in one year, including Champ West and Super Ratings. They've grown dramatically over the past few years and today have more than $58 billion in funds under management and 1.3 million members, making them the fifth largest fund in the country. These accolades and growth in part can be attributed to their strong and clear focus on delivering the best retirement outcomes for their members. And because they're a profit for members fund, all the profits go back into the business to improve the products and services they offer to clients, including registered financial advisors. In addition, their performance is strong. Their balanced investment option has outperformed the industry average over one, three, five, seven, and 10 years to the end of September. And to top it all off, They're a really great bunch to work with. So take the time to find a bit more about what they can offer you and your clients by visiting sunsuper.com.au forward slash advisor. It's great to have Thea back in and uh, Dave, thank you very much for joining us. Um, Now, I know I just said this to you before, but you didn't believe me, but truly the top downloaded podcast that we've ever had was uh, Ray's Conversation With You. So it's awesome to have uh, you back on again. And it's actually kicked off this concept that's dawned on me, and I'm not sure if you guys realize this, but uh, advisors would love to know more about marketing. Well, of course. That's yeah. why you started your business. <laughs> so, uh, uh, okay, you you both live in Vietnam, right? Or, or, or in Southeast Asia, I should yeah, say. Yeah, so we, we developed the, um, the idea for our business in Asia when we were writing content for AX, ASX 100 um, clients, and we realized that it wasn't really a – product out there that was affordable and good content for SMEs, financial advisors, mortgage brokers, accountants. Um, so yeah, we, we designed 99 content overseas over 18 months in Vietnam. Um, yeah. You know, it's a little bit of a startup scene over there. Yeah. And now that it's up and running, we're back in Melbourne. We moved to Melbourne about uh, one month ago. Oh, cool. So you did sort of 18 months or whatever it Three was. Three years in Three Asia. Three years. 18 in, in, in Indonesia where we were writing the content for basically sort of the, the, the top end of town, yeah. um, the banks, the insurance companies. Yeah. And so we actually were doing some content with you and, yeah. and, and Ray Dramas, yeah. um, f- crafting content um, for some content agencies for some of those those big clients. And then, yeah, um, we just thought, hey, there's, there's a lot of opportunity out there for SMEs to get more content as well. Why, why did you move back to Oz? I'll let Thea take this one. <laughs> um, ready to be back closer to family. Awesome. And um, we're expanding the stable. We're getting a, um, a pup turn yeah. um, <laughs> next week. So <laughs> we'll have the dog in the office as well. <laughs> wow, that's cool. And was it was it a great, great experience, three years overseas? Yeah, it was phenomenal. We were, we were really lucky to be able to base ourselves in some amazing cities, amazing food, and then spend a lot of time doing visa runs to fabulous nearby places so <laughs> it was it was pretty special that's fantastic um in fact one of the, uh, uh, you guys obviously love to travel uh iraq being one of them and uh and we, we were talking earlier about this very interesting topic of uh being invited into a friendly iraqi household and then they turned out to be swingers so <laughs> so <laughs> How, how, do you, how do you how do you sort of manage that situation? Oh, it was it was amazing. So we spent um, two years in Europe traveling around, Whoa. and the, the last six months we were sort of thinking, well, we've got to go back to Australia with some sort of work under our belt. Like yeah. we can't have yeah. just two years backpacking yeah. as a resume if you want to work in Parliament House as a, in the press gallery. Yeah. So we're like, where should we go? And we're like, okay, well. we'll um, Erdogan's grabbing more power in Turkey. Let's head that way. Whoa. On the way, we stopped by a prison. There's a Sydney person in jail over in Bulgaria, so we, we did a documentary for ABC on that. And then we're like, once we got to Turkey, we're like, let's go to Iraq. And then 
Basically, it was, it was posted um, pre ISIS, so it was that little golden period <laughs> oh, about five years right. ago where it was relatively safe to travel in northern Iraq. Wow. Yeah. So we were just everyone was amazing. Like we first got there and sitting in a restaurant, all nervous and. Basically, a person comes up to us and pays for our meal. And then from there, we just had two weeks of amazing hospitality. Wow. And then, you know... So from going from thinking we were going to sort of yeah. run into a, a real trouble in Iraq to just being so welcomed with absolute open arms. Yeah, and, um, yeah, it wasn't just there. Like, Thea, who initially blamed me for losing the passports, lost our passports one day. <laughs> and it took about... We thought we had to go to Baghdad to the embassy, which we did not want to go to. Mm. And then anyway, we ended up getting them. Um, but in the meantime, we got looked after by um, we got looked after by the community. They yeah. they welcomed us in, and then stayed there. So we just had an amazing time. Let our guards down a little bit. Um, <laughs> and yes, the very last uh, night when we went to pick up our car, um, we crossed back into Turkey. So yeah. it was the the border with Turkey and Iran. Right, to Iraq, to, to, Iraq. To, sorry. Yeah, Turkey and Iraq, and. This family. So this this family worked in Iraq every day. Doing, uh, yes. Doing runs, they'd, they'd go and get oil and then bring it back into Turkey. So oh wow! I thought we'd spend a bit more time finding a little bit about that. How there's yeah. that sort of um, those sort of jobs going right on the border. And um, yeah, we're walking around the the suburbs of um, this this border town where there was armored vehicles and everything. All the women were in niqabs. A very very conservative part of uh, the world and. Anyway, uh, we were introduced to the, the family, the kids, and it was, seemed like quite a normal evening. Um, we went to bed, and then about 10 minutes after we sort of went to sleep, there was a little knock on the door, and we started getting all worried, <laughs> like, have we done something culturally insensitive? What's going yes. on? Yes, and then you've gone to bed. <laughs> yes, and then they sat on the end of the bed, and for the next two hours, we were saying the words no. <laughs> Holy <laughs> moly. <laughs> That is a travel experience. Yeah, and uh, yeah, you know, we were a little bit naive, I guess, but yeah. uh, it sort of, may, on the flip side, the positive we try and take out of is don't judge a book by its cover. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Even in the most <laughs> conservative parts of the world, there are... They're more know, liberal more, than us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that is cool. And um, and so you, you're doing all this traveling and uh, you, you at the same time, you decided to start this business um, and it ends up being 99 content, right? Mm. And um, where's the name come from? First of all, um, the name is obviously there's two there's two reasons to it. We, the the cost is ninety nine dollars a month. Oh, but that's right. not the only thing. The tagline is we do ninety nine percent of the work. You, right, you hit publish. Cool. So oh, we basically try and take all the work out of it involved. It's easier than creating a Facebook post because it's just logging into your WordPress website, hitting publish on the content. Yeah. So you don't even need to type the status out. And so. Uh, there are many different ways to, to uh, get clients. There's many different types of marketing, and, uh, and this marketing series is, is all about that. Um, for, all, for all professions, actually, th that's kind of like what, what I'm going to focus in on here. So what is it about content marketing that, uh, that you both believe is the most effective form of marketing? I like content marketing because it gives. It doesn't just uh, pop up in your face and ask for something of you. By marketing content, you're providing information, you're providing an educational service, you are giving something. Um, and it's the kind of marketing that um, may have a longer lead time, but um, by prov regularly providing that kind of educational content, um, you're really demonstrating your value in between appointments. Yeah. So ha ha have you guys looked at the success rate of content marketing? And, and, and before we even get to the results are, what in, in your mind, what is the process of getting content in front of people in order for them to receive the value? So the the process is quite simple. Everyone's got their their their, their email lists, their Facebook businesses. Right. It's pretty. So much so set you're just up. shooting them an email. Um, basically, but you're trying to just more make it look like you're offering value. You're not saying, "Hey, come visit me for yes. a, for a, for a yes. checkup." It's, yes. Hey, there's there's been this industry change that could affect um, your financial situation at the moment. If you think you fall into this category, 
might want to give us a buzz, or if you know someone that, that does. Um, okay, so it's topical, and you're trying to you're trying to distill um, what's happening in and around financial planning, or, or whatever the topic is, yeah. and turn it into a piece a knowledge base for an advisor or, or mortgage broker or accountant with an existing mailing list is this it what do you think okay so this is this is less about capturing new eyeballs but it's more about uh what what would i say warming up the existing uh eyeballs that you have well there's two sides of the coin there is the the capturing the new leads which takes a lot of effort and a lot of work and is worth it Um, yes but then there's people that just don't have the time or the the expertise to write content each week because yes. to be able to do the first one where you're getting all the new leads you've got to be good at it and you've got to do it regularly and to be honest it is something that not for everybody you know um, and it does take a lot of time to see those results so people sort of do it for about three months and give up mm-hmm. the, the service that we offer is basically more geared towards your existing client base for referrals to their friends at the barbecue, you know, or their family at the barbecue when something comes up, financial topic. You're going to be front of centre, front of their mind when they've gone, hey, my uh, my financial advisor gave me something about that on the weekend. I'll flick it your way. Yeah, okay. So in, considering, considering the content, okay, because I'm just trying to figure out, and I, I, I used to think, that perhaps content, right? Because everyone here is content is king. Yeah. So you're you're suggesting that content is not optimal for acquisition, but for for being for being in front of people so that you're at the front of their mind when they are ready to make a decision. I would say it is content is king for acquisition, but it okay. is extremely difficult to do right. Like, you know, we We've been writing for about 10, 12 years, probably more, like, and it's still a very hard thing to get right. There's only about 1% of financial advisors that can write beautiful content that gets out there and gets their name out there and they become yeah. the go-to person. And yeah. that's, that's how they get to be that go-to person in the industry. They've got really good content. Um, no one, that, the market will be too crowded if everybody was that good at doing it as well. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. the service that... We, we try and set up is, hey, not everyone's going to be brilliant at that, but mm. you can still put out really good content to your existing client base and get noticed and referrals that way. So, yes, it is good for qu- client acquisition if you can nail it yourself mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. have the time and the output to do so. Mm-hmm. But then sometimes you just got to go, I'm not the best at this. I'm really good at building customer relations, spending time with client, knowing what their problems are. Um, I'll leave that side of the thing to somebody else. So we've got client acquisition on one hand. We've got uh, sort of in the middle here this warming up of, of existing uh, eyeballs, and then we've got conversion. You hmm. could say of those of those eyeballs into into clients, um, which is really good for me to actually figure out what what that framework is. Because uh, for as much as I enjoy marketing and and I think I think the reason why I like marketing is because it's sales but it's not face to face. There's something about face to face sales that as an individual it throws me off. I I don't know why. Yeah. Uh, especially if I believe in the value that I'm yeah. delivering, but there is there is something th- uh, but I think I'm in the minority there. I think a lot of people are, are quite good and comfortable with that and they should be. I think the problem with with sales is when you have someone that's really good at the sales technique, but is not very good at the value delivery behind those sales. I actually love it when someone's great at sales and great at delivering value, at, you know, for what they've just sold you for. And so uh, the reason why I really like marketing is it gives you the chance to do sales, but at scale. Mm. And uh, and and what I'm what I'm hearing from from you both is content is. Uh, is a valuable way to scale uh, knowledge, right? And and one of the people I talk about uh, Chris a lot. Chris Bates does a lot of content on LinkedIn as a platform. He sort of figured out that uh, LinkedIn is a microblogging service, and I'd never thought of it like that. And I'm, I'm not sure if he's even used those words. 
uh, to me. But certainly uh, that's what he's used it for. And he, he often does two posts a day, one about finance and one about life in general. Um, I, when I, I wrote a book a few years ago, I wanted to, you know, punch myself repeatedly in the face uh, for 18 months, uh, but it's done. And off the back of that, I made partnerships mm. with uh, fintechs. At the time, Acorns was quite big and I became their sort of resident finance guru for, for about six months. And, and I was writing uh, content once a week for them. Yep. And so after wanting to punch myself in the face for 18 months writing a book, I then wanted to punch myself every Friday <laughs> because I was then writing content. And what I realized was um, I can do it, but it takes a lot of time. It takes uh, a lot of concentration. Um, even even if I was to do Facebook, uh, sorry, LinkedIn posts like Chris was doing, I, again, I, I can do them, but it takes it takes a long time for me to sort of uh, dig something up from my knowledge base, uh, attach it to something that's topical uh, and deliver it in a way. Um, and I've, I've unfortunately got a, a part of my personality that's just like it just insists on sounding like a complete douchebag when I write. So I'll use the word, um, for example, saunter. There's no, there's no need to use that word. And I, and in my mind, I think, haha, it sounds funny. Everyone's going to get, get, going to know it's a joke. No, yeah. ne- never comes across. It always, I read it years later, and I think, why did I write that? Um, so. It's a skill set, and let's talk about actually. Thea, I'd love to know where where you built the skill set in order to be able to, um, you know. So we we're talking before the podcast is that you were a correspondent reporter, um, and th- it's a skill set, right? Like yeah. it's it's something. And, and where did you learn it from? And and t- tell us it's, about that. It, and it, it's certainly something that you can develop. Um, I think one of the um, key initial learnings of any journalism course is tell it like you'd tell it at a barbecue. So instead of coming to me with the background or um, or some sort of um, build up, go straight to the punchline. So if you were talking to a mate at a barbecue about what happened today, what would be the most interesting thing, kick it off with that. And so that's how you... Um, you deliver sort of you, communication. You start with the the most catchy start with piece. the punchline, right? Drag people in, and then you can go through and um, develop your ideas. Um, and I think, as you were alluding to with with the reference to the word saunter, you do it in a very conversational way. It doesn't have to be blokey or disingenuous, yeah. Um, but certainly deliver it the way that you would speak, um, and that makes it very accessible and very readable. With with the rise of blogging, right? Do you do you shudder when you just go onto the internet? Is, is are you reading everything that's happening and, and you just think, wow, I can't believe the, the people are passing this off as content. Yes, there is a lot of <laughs> um, rubbish out there. Um, I think there are some simple things that you can do to develop good content. The first thing being come up with, as I said, that one initial idea and just hang it around that. Don't try to bring in too many other things. Come up with a leading concept and then three dot points that will back up that or develop that concept. And and basically you also, just going back to what you said about Saunter, give it to your, your new wife and ask her what she thinks about the use of that word. And if she tells you, I'm not sure about it, when in doubt, leave it out. Like, you know? Yes. Um, you know, you just, sometimes you're just trying to get too much in and you yeah. really want to and, and it reads well in your mind, and, and it probably it might. You know, sometimes it's worth taking a little risk or two. But mm-hmm. every now and then, you've just got to you've got to be ruthless. You've got to cut it. You've got to you've got to try and aim for that sweet spot of four hundred to six hundred words because people have short attention spans. Four, so, so you recommend four hundred to six hundred words? Yep. Yeah. And um, break it up. We don't, you don't want to see big slabs of text. It's not like a uni assignment where you have a, a five sentence paragraph, one sentence per paragraph is tons because when you're reading particularly on the web you need all of that white space um and that's where your like your sub categories can come in oh interesting one sentence per paragraph 
Yep, absolutely. That's what you do in a newspaper. That's what you do on any online news forums. That's the style. Yeah. Or at the very most, one concept per paragraph. You know, you want to keep it quite nice and spaced out, like very digestible. I'm guessing clients are like your children. You, everyone wants to think they're they're also smart and, and bright and brilliant. They probably are. You know, more savvy than the <laughs> average person, but. Make it easy for them, you know. A lot of um, research shows that people only make it down two or three sentences before and they get the general concept and and then go to the next, see what's happening with the Kardashians or something, you know. That's who you're pretty much competing with, you know. Entertainment space. Like people have only got so much time in their day to read online content. So the more... The easier you can make it for them to read, the more they're going to get down into the whole article and, and, and basically understand what you're trying to get across. Yeah, so just removing all of the all, all the barriers between the ease of being able to consume the content and natural life getting in the way. That makes sense. Okay, so if to, to dive into that a little bit more, so we're going to go most exciting thing right up front. What, what's your next sentence or two? Yeah, so start with the hook. Right, mm-hmm. really heavy hook with the grabbing intro, the, the the opening paragraph. The next sentence or two, you really want to sort of just keep it quite tight. Explain the concept, what's happening. Don't try and maybe use an analogy or two, but don't drag it out for five, six parts before you start getting into the the media, uh, the the meatier parts of it. You want to really get to the point real quick. You know, uh, I. I the, all the blogs that I read that have four or five paragraphs, quite chunky, before they get to the what I'm there for, I, I give up on. I'm not sure about you, but I sort of tend to just like, oh, come on, get on with it. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think uh, there are people that do content remarkably well. I think Tim Ferriss mm. is, is an example of that. He talks about some crazy stuff, but he just delivers it in a in a very easily read format and I, I think probably uh, talking about what we something you mentioned before like only one percent of people can do that really well I think he's probably an example of of doing that really well um, I'm guilty of this as, as most people are and and it's so it's it's almost I, I I get upset when I see this happen and so I never had a blog on any any website any any uh, financial planning website. And uh, the reason why I didn't is because uh, I just couldn't keep it up. And that, I guess, is something interesting. Or, or what I find is people like evergreen content, yes, yeah. In, in my opinion, yes, they do. Only the really good stuff, though, um, because actually what people want is the newest thing, whatever the newest thing is. And if you think about uh, Facebook, if you go back in time, Facebook back a a decade ago was all about your profile. And then after a couple of years, it turned all about the news feed, about home. And then it's always just your new stuff that's at the top. And I I realized that for some reason, our brains are are more inclined to to want to know what's new rather than uh, the evergreen. And so um, I struggled to write new content all the time. So I tried really hard for a while. I think I tried for about six months to do a Fund Your Ideal Lifestyle blog, um, which was, you know, I, I tried to do thousands of words uh, once once a month, a video, a podcast, and uh, some other thing, I can't remember. But I tried to hit sort of four different styles of content all about the same subject once a month. And it's difficult. It's really mm-hmm. difficult to punch out uh, a lot of content, um, hence why we ended up here at XY doing uh, podcasts, yeah. simply <laughs> because a conversation <laughs> is easier than a blog. You know, everyone can talk. Um, this is something I find quite interesting about what you guys do, which is you are helping advisors get more new content out. And from my understanding, uh, the, the the problems that you you were looking to solve was less to do with creating evergreen content, but more to do with that news feed, getting it to the top, uh, you know. Uh, of, and so are we talking weekly emails out to the database or are we talking twice a week or or how when you're when, when someone's trying to stay at the top of 
of the tension of a database, how often are we talking about hitting them? Do you want to go? Or? Okay. Um, we send out weekly content to our right. um, financial advisor subscribers. Uh, we recommend they send it out weekly, uh, fortnightly or monthly. Don't want to bombard your, your audience too much. You don't want to be that annoying person that ends up on their Facebook feed all the time. Yeah. So you, you can flood it you, and um, we advise not to. Um, we would recommend probably yeah, once a week or fortnight maximum, Not unless you're doing your own great content that people are flocking towards. You know, you basically just want to keep front of mind on a fortnightly basis. Yeah. Um, some of our subscribers only send out their content each month, which is also, you know, in that sweet spot. Mm -hmm. I guess it's sort of one of those suck it and see approaches, you know, just find out what's working with your best, how much engagement you're getting with your posts, and then, you know, a little bit of A-B testing involved. So in a perfect scenario, you would have an engine to develop uh, new, con new, new, new contacts, uh, an engine to develop new content, and then uh, a process in order to convert those mm. uh, people that are interested into clients. One of the um, one of the things that I find really interesting more and more these days is the concept of community. Mm. Um, community has been a big thing for X Y. Um, one time I did an interview with you, and you were so, sort of asking around, you know, what are some unique ways to to get buy in? Yeah. And actually, I mentioned it. It was community building a community on, uh, on a Facebook group, and um, and what uh, uh, Finn Kelly from from um, Wealth Enhancers was saying, uh, having a good community is one of the four things that uh, that a good financial advisor can can do. Are you seeing any advisors building communities more than just an email database? So uh, the way that I sort of foresee it is why, wh wh why aren't advisors sort of building online communities and then taking content and producing it in that format uh, rather than just email? Because content can be on any platform, right? So mm. it doesn't have to be on email. Mm. It's bloody hard in a nutshell, <laughs> as you probably know. Yeah. I mean, you guys did a phenomenal job building the XY. A community. lot of hard work. Yeah, and um, that article that I um, interviewed you for a while back was – I've shared that with a lot of people, and it, it is a very great idea, but it's it's one of those things that might be easy to talk about but yeah. hard to execute, and yeah. you really need to get that right from day dot. How, how are subjects decided upon? Obviously, you, you guys are an engine – um, that professionals can can dip into to have the content written for them. That that's your value prop. How 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 does how does ninety nine content go about deciding what it is that that people are interested in? Often it's what comes up in conversations um, with advisors. It's your ear to the ground that gives us the best idea of um, what people are asking about that week or that month. And so often um, they're not necessarily evergreen topics, but they're certainly um, more educational. I mean, often we find people will go through a, a two-week, three-week period where they're getting back-to-back -back questions about, I don't know, something as simple as, as negative gearing and they feel like, I've had this conversation five times in the last two weeks, let's push something out on that. Or the um, childcare changes. Yeah, childcare, like, yeah, often, yeah, it's a bit more topical. Yeah, we get in touch with our subscribers all the time. Right. Well, we practice what we preach, we send them a newsletter each, each, oh, you'd each, hope so. each week, yeah, <laughs> telling them what the content is being pushed into their website, how it'll yep. look on their website. Cool. And then at the bottom, call to action. You got anything for us? What are you hearing? You know, get in touch. We want to, we want to hear the stories. And every week, someone writes back. Hey, I've been hearing this from my clients. Can we get something out on this? So, uh, so when the content goes out, it's going out onto their website, not in an email. No. So um, we send them the content in an email, mm -hmm. saying, "Hey, this is what's been put in your site. This is how it'll all look. This is you know." Um, but it's also in the back end. By that stage, it's already in their website in draft form, ready right. to go. And then they just hit publish, and it'll look pretty much similar to what our e-newsletter. Yeah, right. So you guys must be WordPress masters at this stage. 
mate. We're very good at uh, learning things on the go. <laughs> <laughs> do you ever get? Do you ever get uh, really old school sort of hard coded? You know, HTML that you that there's not even an easy way to to hit publish. No, it's always you know WordPress is really funny. It's so uniform, but every WordPress theme's a little bit different. You know, sometimes the, the image shape won't fit one website just right, but normally normally it does. Um, but haven't run into too many WordPress hiccups yet. But we've got someone if in case it does that there's someone on the job. Um, but yeah, I've, I've had to learn a little bit of HTML coding as Oof. well. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, was, it was a little bit of fun. You know, once you see when you put something in code and then you see it change on the, on the page, <laughs> you like you can you can work out how Zuckerberg's uh, coders work those 24 hour shifts oh. stop those little adrenaline <laughs> feedbacks. Right, I'd have to go back to my GeoCities days <laughs> uh, in the early. 2000s. I remember I, I had some HTML code doing something. I can't quite remember, but yeah, I, I, I can faintly remember um, being interested by it. Um, look, th- there's a lot of content in the world, right? Huge amounts. Uh, you, you're probably in a better position to be able to uh, tell me exactly how much, but to the to the tune of you know, I, I could be I'm inventing numbers here, but billions of blogs, right, per month or whatever. Um, why? Why does why people still care about content marketing? Well, you know, as as, in, as, as, a, as a, consumer, a consumer, yeah, um, it's everywhere. Why? Why do I? Why do I? I don't have time. Why am I going to sit down and, and read a five minute article? You got to make it. You got to make it. Drag them in. You got to. You got to make. That's the important bit. You've got to have a lead that says, "Is this applicable to you?" Yeah, and it's got to be applicable to a large percentage of your client base because. If it's not, then they're just going to keep the scroll button going yeah. down to the next thing. Maybe yeah. a new puppy that their friend's got or something on Facebook. Yeah. Uh, or the next email that's in there. So, you know, you've got to have a strong hook. And it's all about what what is that hook, what Theo alluded to earlier. And that's how you make them care. Because, you know what, You're, there's a lot of, there is a lot of competition out there for their eyeballs, you know. 100%. And, and I'm the same, mate. I'm, I I. I'm in front of a screen for about 12 hours a day working Oof. on the two businesses. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you, you, there is a lot of fighting for your attention. So what you've got to do is try and make it as focused as possible on what your clients, what matters to them. And yeah. you know what matters to them. Like you're, you're, you're in touch with them on a daily basis. And without falling into the trap of trashy clickbait, you kind of do mm. want to make it clickbait. You want to, you want your hook and your lead to um, surprise or intrigue or create a sense of urgency. There's got to be some sort of emotional reaction to that headline and first few lines of the story that makes people want to get in, feel that they are compelled to get in now and read that now. So I think that um, is probably what you're looking for when you're you're um, putting together that hook or that lead. How does one avoid becoming BuzzFeed? It's good, a difficult question, question, right? Uh, well, you know, you, you just don't, for example, say the 10 most drastic right. consequences of what's <laughs> going to happen with the childcare changes. Okay. Is your kid going to be affected? <laughs> right. <laughs> right, right, right. It's like, hey, there's some childcare changes coming into play. Yeah. Could this affect you? Find out with our latest article. Not like, you know. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's weird, you know, the amount of looking into content uh, that I have discovered some strange things about humanity. So, um, and, and I'm sure... You, you both would know this very uh, more adequately than I do, and that is people are driven um, or our strongest emotion or what we react to the most is anger. And and, and a lot of these uh, headlines or, or news articles and, and pretty much journalism is just a, a, a result of what people are clicking on, right? And it turns out we're clicking on the things that are, you know, unbelievable and uh, worst thing ever, and uh, mm. yeah, as, as you said, the consequence of and and um, and it always reminds me of when um, <laughs> you know the 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 relatively successful Australian entrep- entrepreneur Dick Smith created a uh, newspaper called the Good News newspaper mm. yeah. and lasted for, I believe, exactly one, <laughs> one <laughs> publication. And, uh, yeah, it's, it, it is crazy. So 
you so people people listening to this you know uh, are going to have some concept of these things right so when they're sitting down to to read oh sorry to 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 create content how do they use these levers that we all know to use without falling into you know like a a, a situation where they end up being buzzfeed so to speak it's a good question um but essentially, when we write our articles, we write it from the perspective of the advisor speaking to their clients. And what that means is your readers will essentially think that it's it's the advisor talking to them. Yeah. Now, it's really important for us not to write negative stories or, or have drastic consequences when that's going. We try and keep it extremely positive as though the advisor is actually speaking to their client themselves because... Now, I'm not a financial advisor. However, I can imagine if I was, I'd try and remain optimistic in all my dealings with clients and encouraging and, you know, while a little bit like, you know, making sure you don't over-promise and under-deliver. Yeah. Um, so we try to steer away from bad news and, and negative and we try to put good positive spins on things and, and encourage and, and have positive reinforcement in all the stories that we write rather than... Um, talking about how the sky is falling in because of this one legislation change. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Congratulations, everyone. The Royal Commission is on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, and, you know, we try and also frame the – I'm glad you brought that. We don't shy away from that a whole lot. Like we do put content out there on on that talking about, hey, it's not people like us that they're after. Yeah. You know, we're, we're, we're the good guys, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Um, they're they're – chasing the, the bigger bigger players and, and the malpractices that are occurring in that space. Um, so we do try and put a positive spin on it and, and make sure that, you know, the clients of our subscribers understand that, hey, these guys have still got our best interests at heart. And so, and, oh, sorry. And I think good, um, good content marketing is empowering. Essentially, you should be, you're providing value. So you're, yes, you're talking about um, an issue that if uh, mishandled, may lead to certain consequences, but you're empowering um, the client to understand that, to come into you from a position of um, taking a positive step um, rather than striking fear in them because ultimately you should be ending with a call to action, which is, hey, it's, you know, yes, things could go wrong, but it's not that bad. Come in, let's have a chat about it and we'll set you on the right track. Yeah. How many different, just to duck into your, your business for a moment, how many different fields do, do, is, is your company creating content for? Two, basically, primarily. Mm-hmm. Mortgage brokers and account, uh, and financial advisors, sorry. Yep. Uh, we do have a third accountants that do, but we don't, we've don't. we stopped doing content specifically for accountants just so we can focus on financial advisors and mortgage brokers at this stage. Primarily because uh, you can write one f- financial advice story a week one mortgage broking content story a week, and then the two will have some overlaps, eighty percent of the seventy five percent of the time. So you can give them each, each, um, each industry a little bit extra content. You know, sometimes you know they won't publish the story, which is fine. But if we can do that and provide them with extra value, we do. Accountants, we're probably going to focus on again in the new year. But at the moment, we just want to make sure that the clients that we've got and the subscribers that we, we give them the best possible content that we can. Yeah, how, how did you how did you come across this business model? So yeah, basically I was writing for, um, you know, um, the the content agencies. Yes. And I was, I can't remember, I was, it was for um, a, a hub where I was writing for financial advisors and another one where I was writing for mortgage brokers. And they didn't have access to good content that was affordable. Like, you know, people kept asking me, hey, I've noticed that you're doing um, content. Oh, I was like, we charge $500 an article. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, we, we can't, I don't think, you know, you feel almost felt guilty saying that. Um, so then I just came up with the idea that if I could write one article and find 50 subscribers and, and charge them $10 each for yeah. the article, then, um, then I could actually do it. And then I sort of had a few beers with Thea's dad, discussed it. <laughs> Thea didn't completely reject the idea, <laughs> which I know it's normally a goer then. <laughs> and the other thing um, that is different to the content that is provided often for free by um, 
by licensing groups, etc., is the way that it is coded to ensure that there's no duplicate content issues. So um, that can be, although there is content that's made available by peak bodies and things like that, there can be issues that you run into if you are publishing that verbatim. Yeah, you just you need to make sure it's it's got the correct um, canonical linking in place, which we do automatically um, when we put it into their articles, uh, into their websites. So uh, you, you see a lot of websites do run into that, that sort of trouble a lot where they'll just rip it off one other page, put it on theirs and, and not do the canonical linking properly, which can lead to SEO issues with on, on Google. What's canonical linking? Yes. Yeah, so, well, we don't want to give too much of our <laughs> secrets away, but um, <laughs> basically you've got to make sure that there's a canonical link if you're having content that's on a website and it's ripped from somewhere else or you know it exists somewhere else yes you've got to make sure that you have a canonical link that's an invisible link but that basically tells google or the other search engine overlords Oh. Hey, this is part of a syndicated network. We're putting our hands up and saying, "Oh, this—it's meant to be here. This it's is the original here. source. Oh, Don't punish these right. guys for republishing it." Oh, cool! Yeah, and so that's where there's a lot of there's a lot of duplicate content. Um, you know, you ask twenty people mm. what it is, and you'll probably get twenty different responses. However, this is what Google recommends as best practice: is the canonical linking. There's other ways you can pre- tell Google not to index this page and whatnot. Sure. What Google likes is when you put these canonical links in. Um, the reason why it's so effective on WordPress for us is because we can push that content with that canonical link in automatically. Squarespace we can't. However, mm. they can do it manually, which mm-hmm. takes only another. 30 seconds to a minute. Sure. So we still take on Squarespace, um, people that Squarespace websites, but it's just a tiny little bit of extra work that's involved. Yeah, financial planning websites are, are, are just the weirdest, weirdest thing. They all, so many of them look so similar. Mm. And if you look at them through the eyeballs of someone who's not a financial planner, I think I think a lot of these websites do more to confuse the client than, than they do uh, help them. I, I mean, there are exceptions to those rules, but, uh, you know, most financial planning um, websites, you, you turn up on and there's no, I mean, there's not even a purpose for them, right? There's nothing to do. There might be a join a newsletter thing, but yeah. that's maybe. And um, other than that, it's, it's uh, just very sort of standard and generic um, so the language, uh, I actually want to dive into personas a little bit more yeah, yeah, because, yeah, no um, that's something at XY we've started paying a lot more attention to. Mm-hmm. So at the moment on our Facebook group, we are one, li- literally one stream and, it, and, and everything that goes on that group has to be valuable, hopefully to at least the majority of people. But the problem with, with the group being sort of the size that it is now um, it's hard. It's yeah. really difficult. Yeah. And so we're actually working on a solution at the moment to to help uh, to help with nailing help helping people nail what it is that they're interested in getting a little bit more into. and mm-hmm. And the more that we dive into that, we're sort of realizing that our community, um, much like I guess your your client base, our advisors at different stages in their career with different types of clients that are doing different things. Mm-hmm. and we've been thinking about how best to talk to the community. And while we haven't as yet decided upon these avatars or these personas, it's definitely on the the horizon. So that's coming up, I would say, within the next couple of months. We're very much going to sit down and figure out who's there and how do we best talk to them about exactly what it is. And, And it might actually just be as simple as asking people, what they're most interested in. Like, I don't think there's that much science behind it, but yeah. we've never asked. Yeah. And so um, are you delivering that kind of service? Do you have, right, uh, these, this, this messaging or this weekly piece of content is for our 
our advisors whose client base is 25 to 45, and then this is 60 and above, and this is 45 to 60. Are, are you starting to get into that level of, of, uh, of persona? Yeah, so we do. We, we try because we look at all our subscribers and their businesses, and you want to make sure that someone who's focusing on SMSFs has that content yeah. into, into their, to yeah, their Yeah, definitely. Audience. But then you've also got another subscriber that's looking for the, the just tap into the huge potential of the millennial market that's Correct. coming through. So you've got to make sure you balance it out. You don't yes. want one of you, one end of your subscribers going, hey, you're not giving us enough content up the yeah. top here, mate. And you don't want the others to say, hey, you're giving us too much in the property market space, trying to break into the first home buyers. Mm. A couple of my, um, uh, a lot of my clients are. Um, property investors that are a bit savvy. So you've just got to mix it up and you've got it. We do have content mapped out going about three months ahead, mm -hmm. but obviously legislation change, le legislative changes come into place. Yeah. So, so things get bumped down the line. Yes. Well, you've got to be flexible at the same time. Yeah. You've got to, uh, so yeah, A, you've got to map it out because we've got to practice what we preach, you know, you know, totally. we wanna, yep. um, so we map it out. But we're flexible. Things can shift coming in. And we do give a really good spread. And what percentage of your client base is doing their own, comp you know, they're complementing your content on top? I'd say probably about 50-50. Yeah, right. Maybe a little bit less. Yes. Um, I find they do at the start. And then mm -hmm. once we sort of give them that steady stream and they know that that's just ticking over, looking after itself quite mm. nicely, then we find that they... Sort of, because I do keep an eye on all the websites because, yes, you know, you get a really big buzz seeing how it looks <laughs> and, and, and how it makes their website look. Yeah. And, you know, I, I really, you know, take pride in what we do. So Absolutely. We go around all the websites, look, and then sometimes if we notice, like, um, that they've there's something that they could improve, mm -hmm. then we give them feedback on that, politely, obviously. Yeah. But, like, you know. Um, well, before we, before we uh, kick off um, and tell people how that they can touch base with you, I'd love for for perhaps for you both just to give your top tip, your number one idea that if people were to either improve what they're currently doing or to get the gumption to start doing it, what would be your top idea for them to improve their content marketing skills? Do you want to go first or you want me to go? You go. <laughs> okay. Uh, don't be afraid to write. Just write. If, some, if you, so many people get stuck because they just can't write, just start putting words on a page. Just, well, no matter if, it's, if it sucks, it doesn't matter. You're the only one that's going to read it or maybe maybe your partner will read it. Um, but that doesn't matter. They're always supportive, you know. So just write and then, the, and then edit it, edit it down, just write it and then try and get it with subheaders and, and within 500 words. But if you're stuck, just skip on to the next section that you can think about and don't do it like if if you don't know what a nice fancy intro is, just start getting into the meat of it and then come back to the intro later. But just start writing cool. and, and, and set some time aside each week to do so. Yeah. I think um, planners are obviously um, often great speakers um, and their strength is sitting in front of someone and explaining something face to face. So if you're looking at a blank piece of paper and feeling quite terrified by that, one thing that you can do is simply record, hit record on your desktop, um, talk straight down the microphone, and then there's these great um, transcribing services. Um, so you just record whatever the topic is that you want to discuss, um, drop it in that transcribing service. There's one called Trint mm -hmm. and there's one called Trint's, the other one Trint's that's fantastic. good. Yeah. Uh, it's T R I N T dot com. Awesome. You know, it's about thirty cents Australian dollars a word. It'll uh, um, a minute it'll uh, <laughs> That's so cheap. That's, uh, th yeah, so it's because I think Rev dot com charges a dollar. dollar. Yeah. But this one's automatic for you, it happens instantly and it's about ninety five percent accuracy. And it'll get Whoa. to know your voice. Yeah. And that Whoa. way you're not starting with a blank piece of paper. You've got something on paper that you can then group and rearrange or break up with sub subheaders or massage or think, what was I yabbering on about there? Let's delete that whole section. <laughs> You've got something to 
cut down, whereas if you're starting with nothing, that's often quite overwhelming. Actually, that's better than my tip because you record <laughs> you record it, all the conversations anyway, right? Like yeah. um, as a financial advisor. So this it's there. you just got to plug it into a computer mm. um, and then – it, it'll write it for you and then you just massage it out, yeah. Awesome. Forget what I said, just listen to it there. <laughs> uh, well, look, thank you so much for coming back on. For uh, the advisors that are interested in uh, finding out more, how do they contact you? Okay, so it's 99content.co, C-O. Um, and, yeah, that's got all our contact details on that webpage. We're going to be running a two-month free trial for anyone who's part of the XY um, community. Oh, cool. So um, just obviously let us know when you get in contact that uh, you, you, you found out through uh, you lovely guys and uh, <laughs> we'll go from there. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Um, I know marketing is a huge uh, topic and client acquisition. And uh, yeah, look, it's uh, been hugely valuable. I think content marketing is definitely one of those key pieces that a lot of advisors uh, do need to nail down. So uh, thank you very much for your insights. No thank worries. You. Pleasure to be here. Cheers.